Oh, good. Thanks, Ian. And John, too. We are kind words of welcome tonight. Now, maybe you're wondering what I'm doing sitting down. It's a good question. I, uh, I was in the hospital on Sunday, would you believe? In the Ulster Clinic. I had a hernia at the back of my belly button here. So seven stitches on the inside of my stomach and four staples on the outside of it. Uh, but uh, that didn't stop me from coming to Bali Seven. Good to be here. And uh, if I'd have been anywhere else, I wouldn't have went. But I wanted to come to Bali Seven. Because you're like coming to the front room. And it's like being with a family. So that's good. And uh, we'll just trust the Lord. We'll bless his word to us tonight as we look at it. Now last week... Uh, I'm here two nights for us here. Last Thursday night we looked at Psalm 84. We're going to look at Psalm 40 tonight. And then I'm back for two weeks in um, in February. And we'll look at uh, another psalm, at least there may be two psalms on that occasion in the will of the Lord. So we're turning to Psalm 40 tonight. And this is a well-known psalm. And I had looked at many psalms through the week. In fact, when I was leaving here last Thursday night I had probably in my head that would go to Psalm 139, but as the week went on and over the weekend too, just a few, three or four, few different circumstances, I ended up at this Psalm, Psalm 40. And I'm going to read the whole Psalm, but I want to concentrate mostly on the first three or four verses uh, when we do read it. But the, the sentence of God's word that gives light. So Psalm 40 and verse 1. I waited patiently. For the Lord. Suppose we should read first of all that it was to the chief musician, and it's a psalm of David that we'll think about in a minute or two. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me, and he heard me cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, and out of the Mary clay, and he set my feet upon a rock. And establish me goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth. Even praise unto our God. Many shall see it. And shall fear. And shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust. And respecteth not the proud. Nor such as turn aside the lies. Many O Lord may God are they wonderful works which I have done. And thy thoughts which are to usward, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than ten the number. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine eyes hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book that is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is written within my heart. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. Withhold not thy tender mercies from me, O Lord, that thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. What a prayer that is. Verse 11. For innumerable evils have compassed me about me in iniquities and have taken hold upon me, so I am not able to look up there more than the hairs of mine head. Therefore my heart faileth me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me, O Lord. Make haste to help me. Let them be ashamed and confounded together, that seek after my soil to destroy it. Let them be driven backward and put to shame that wish be evil. Let them be desolate for the reward of their shame that say unto me, Aha, aha. Let them that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. Let such as love thy salvation say continually, The Lord be magnified. But I am poor in thee, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Thou art my help and my deliverer. Make no tarrying, O oh my God. Amen. And the Lord will bless his word to us tonight. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful psalm that we've read tonight. Thank you that in front of us tonight we have the living, inspired word of the living God. Remember that heaven and earth will pass away, 
but thy word will endure forever. Thank you that we have it in our mother tongue tonight. Give us wisdom, give us help tonight as we try to delve into it tonight. Lord, we pray that you would give us the finest of the week as we ask for help and blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 40 is a psalm of David. We noticed last week that there is 150 psalms recorded on the pages of Scripture. And uh, at least 90 of them are attributed. David's name is on them. Uh, Of course, there are psalms uh, that are attributed to Moses, to the sons of Korah, and so on. But the vast majority of psalms in the Scriptures are attributed to David. As I said last week, I do believe in my heart that perhaps it's only the beginning of them. I reckon maybe when we get to heaven and we all reveal to us, we'll see that David wrote many, many more psalms, even more than on record for us. There's psalms. There's psalms that tell us about the, the words of God. There's psalms that tell us about the ways of God. There's psalms, many psalms that tell us about the wonders of God. And this is a psalm uh, of David. I love David. Great character study in the Old Testament scripture. He says the shepherd boy in Bethlehem when we are introduced to him. He was just a son of Jesse. He was brought up in a poor home in the little town of Bethlehem. Of course, where the saviour of the world would be born. Many generations later, he was of the lineage. Of course, the saviour was of the bloodline of the lineage of David. And David, of course, was Jesse's son. Not told very much about his mother. We don't know her name. But theologians reckon that she died when David was young. Although he does say in some of the Psalms about being the daughter of thine handmaiden. So his mother must have been a wonderful woman. And whether she was taken home at an early age of David's or something like that. Nevertheless, David was a shepherd boy. He was a man who started in the field and who God put in the palace. He was a man who started mounting sheep and ended up to be one of the greatest kings, of course, that Israel had ever seen. He started in Bethlehem. He ended up in Jerusalem. I love that, you know, I love that God uses just particular people, just people from ordinary lives in ordinary places at an ordinary time. I mean, there was many who were much greater in stature. There was many who were much greater, perhaps, in education. There was many who were much greater in many things than David at this particular time. Nevertheless, God had his eye on this shepherd boy in Bethlehem, and God trained them well in the shepherd's field. you remember how the land came and the bear came? Uh, uh, remember, there's a, there's a wee course that's come away into the back of my mind. As I say that now, we saw it in, in Ardmore. One day a roaring land came and then a growling bear. He asked the Lord to strengthen him and slew them then and there. Do you remember that? But Jesus fought a greater fight upon Mount Calvary. He, he conquered sin and death and hell while down on the tree. But David was a shepherd boy. But there was something in the heart and the head and the hands of this man that God had seen. I've been starting in the new year. I'm starting in Genesis again and I'm reading through. And I was just reading about Noah. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And that jumped out at me the other morning. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The, the, the wickedness and the sin fullness of man, only six chapters into the book, into the Bible, Genesis chapter 6, as God looks down in despair, he says, my spirit shall not always strive with man. God was sick of sin already, just six chapters in, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And here's a man, David, and he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, we don't know an awful lot about this psalm. We don't know much about the background but most theologians agree and again agree that it was a time of great distress, of great trial, of great difficulty in David's life. And uh, it's easy to get like that, isn't it? It's easy to end up in distress. It's easy to end up in the trial. It's easy to end up in difficulty. 
could be family, it could be health, it could be finance, it could be many, many different things. Nevertheless, David was in a great trial. There's no doubt about that, used in the language of this psalm. And even though he's in this great trial, he realizes in it all the goodness of God to him. And he's thankful for the goodness of God. And it's good to be thankful. And it's good, even when we're going through a trial, to see God in it all. Because the other psalmist, and the other psalm said, to give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the people of Israel say, for his love endures forever. I want to be very simple tonight. Very simple. The same as where we were last week. I want to think of, first of all, in verse 1, about request. The request. It says, I waited patiently. You know, the wonderful thing about Scripture is, no matter how many times you read it, my old grandmother said this last Thursday night, maybe, my old grandmother used to say, read a verse, and then read it again, and then read it again, and then read it again. And how right she was, because you need to look at every word, and every full stop, and every comma, and all that stuff. So, the Bible says, the first verse says, I waited patiently for the Lord. Now, hands up who is patient. There you are. <laughs> We're all impatient. We're an impatient race. It's just, there's something in us all that we're impatient. Now, you could be more patient than me. That would maybe wouldn't be hard. We're, there's different levels of patience. But I think we all have to confess, if we are honest, that we are not patient people. I mean, when you're sitting in the doctor's surgery, waiting to go in to see the doctor, you know, 10 minutes is a lifetime, isn't it? I don't, when you go into our doctor's surgery, I don't bend it that often, thank goodness, but with one of these um, digital boards up and your name comes up. And so you're sitting in this this waiting room full of people and the next thing there's a beep, beep, and your name, somebody's name comes up. And you say, I wonder who that is, but then whoever it is gets up very quick. You know, so everybody knows your name. But anyway, you're sitting on 10 minutes is a lifetime in the doctor's surgery. And then when you're sitting waiting on the green light, Ten seconds is an eternity, isn't it? So you're sitting waiting and you're against the clock and you have to be at a certain place at a certain time and uh, you're just waiting on the green light. And the red light seems to be a long, long, long time. And then it goes amber and then it goes green. So the ten minutes in the doctor's surgery is the same as the ten seconds sitting in the green light, really, when you think about it. And if you ever... Go to Lurgan. <laughs> if you ever go to Lurgan, when you come off the motorway and head down into the town of Lurgan, there's a railway. And I don't know whether any of you has ever sat at the railway at Lurgan, but it will try your patience. Every time you go William Street to Lurgan, you're waiting on the Belfast train and you wait and you wait and you wait. And I have sat many a time thinking to myself that when I retire, if God spares me and if I have time, I'm going to write a song. And it's going to be entitled, Waiting at the Railway Gates at Lurgan. <laughs> so, anyway, with no patience. You think of Noah in the Bible. Noah, <clears throat> God told him to build an ark. And uh, for 120 years, that man built the ark. What patience that was. God told him how to build it, gave him the measurements, set it all out. Not, uh, well, a few years ago, I ended up in the drawing office in Harlan and Wolf. It's a long story, but I was asked to a meeting, and uh, the meeting, the venue for the meeting was the boardroom in Harlan and Wolf. And uh, it was uh, really an, uh, an amazing place. I was honoured to be there. And uh, when I went into this boardroom, there was a massive, big, long table, the longest board table as ever had. It's amazing. And, and made of the finest wood, a beautiful, beautiful place. And in it, there was a, 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 a model of the Titanic. And then beside it, there was a model of Noah's Ark. And uh, I, I, I was looking at it, 
and there was a, a plaque on it, and uh, the ratio, the, the, it was all, there was an explanation to it. Anyway, I suppose the point I'm trying to make was that the ratio of Noah's Ark, pro rata, if you understand what that means, was the same as the Titanic. The Titanic sunk, of course, but Noah's Ark didn't sink. She was a perfect boat because God set the measurements in. And then it made the point that every boat that ever has been made since pro rata, whether it's up or down, is based on the measurements of Noah's Ark. Now it's just beside the way. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And this man was patient 120 years, that man built the ark. Imagine it. Made it a gopher wood. And he, and, he, and he made the ark exactly as God told him. And as he made the ark, he preached to the people walking past. He was a preacher of righteousness. And he preached for 120 years and not one got saved. Imagine, that. Imagine having a series of meetings in Bali selling for 120 years and nobody didn't see him. But 120 years uh, and, and no one was saved. And then God told him for Noah and his three sons, Shem, Ham and Japheth and their wives, and they went into the ark, the man of patience. And then I was thinking about just reading last item under two about Jacob. Do you remember old Jacob? He was an old twister and, and schemer. But yet in the early stages of his life, he worked for Laban. And he worked for seven years for a wife. Imagine walking that. Seven years for no money to get a wife. And then on the day of the wedding, Laban had given him their own daughter. And then he worked again. He got Leah and he wanted Rachel, but he worked for 14 years. To get rich and some pay packets and they had patience and so on. But I suppose what I'm saying tonight is there's patience here. David said, I waited patiently for the Lord. So before we leave this tonight, what I want to say to you, the point I want to make is this, that if you're waiting on something, if you're praying for something, and maybe your patience is drawn thin. Well, then keep praying. All right? Times change, things change, but God doesn't change. Do you remember Daniel? He prayed for, was it two weeks? 14 days. And then God answered his prayer, but God said to him, I heard your prayer on the first day in heaven. And yet he let him pray for 14 days. I don't know why. Maybe it was to learn of patience. But if you're praying for something, you keep praying. And if you're praying for a member of your family, you keep praying. Oftentimes, I think of a story of, of a fella, uh, and my dad and I would, would used to preach a lot together, and it was way down in the harbour town of Port of Ogie. And I remember going down on a Sunday night, and there was a big man who used to get up, and he used to cry in the prayer meeting every Sunday night. Tears run down his face. And he lamented for his son. And, and, and he, he, his son just gave him so much bother that I'll not go into tonight, but he, he racked cures and he came home drunk and he just done a pile of things. And this big man used to, used to stand on a Sunday night before the gospel night and cry out to God for his son. And the tears run down his face. Genuine tears. For a son that God would save him. And he prayed and he prayed and he prayed. And then one night, the young fella was away in the fishing boat. He was a fisherman and away in the middle of the night, in the middle of the Irish Sea, God spoke to him. And he got saved in the middle of the night, in the boat on the Irish Sea. And he rung his dad and his mum at three o'clock in the morning to tell them that they'd come to the Lord. So keep praying. God hears you. I waited patiently for the Lord. <clears throat> That's the request. And then you'll notice the result. He inclined unto me and heard me cry. Now, there's something, something amazing here. What does it mean to incline? When, when you incline to someone, you lean towards them. So I was sitting when I was taking a cup of tea down the Lisa tonight, and I was sort of leaning in there to make sure I heard her. My ears aren't the best sometimes. You incline onto someone. 
you, you, you lean in towards him. And so what the psalmist is saying here, that he waited patiently, he prayed, he waited patiently for the Lord, and then the Lord inclined unto him. Isn't it amazing to think that the God of heaven, the one who made the earth, the one who flung the stars into space, the one who knows all things, who is all things, who created all things, by him all things exist. When a penitent saint or sinner waits for him, he inclines, he leans towards him. That's amazing, isn't it? You see, God answers prayer. He inclines on them. And he hears his cry. I'm always amazed at the heart of a mother. Like you think of a mother, she's lying in bed at night, and there's thunder and lightning outside, and the rain's beating off the window. And you can't get to sleep because of the noise of it. And yet, four, three or four rooms away, at the way at the very end of the hall, three or four rooms away, there's a child in a cot, and it whimpers. And the mother hears that child. It's amazing the way women are built, you know. What God does is, think the same as Moses. Do you remember when Moses was in the bulrushes and he headed down, God sent the breeze, and he heads down just a wee baby in the bulrushes, and he cries, and just at that particular stage, Pharaoh's daughter is going in, whatever she was going in for a bath in the river Nile for. But anyway, and the wee baby cries, and she hears it, and there's something that pulls her heart down. You know, and, and I've seen it in church, the, the announce about a baby unborn, which is great, of course, and then two or three weeks later, the baby comes, they bring them in. These amazing things now, aren't they? These, when our children were small, you had to have a car seat, and then you had to have a buggy, and then you had to have a pram, and now everything's in one. It's amazing, you click it in, and then you click it out. But anyway, the children's brought in, and all the women, the men go and say, that's a lovely child, and they walk on. But the women all have to get a wee nurse and all. Something about the heart of a woman. But they hear the child rooms away. And God hears us. We wait patiently for the Lord. He inclines on us. And he hears our cry. God answers prayer. Imagine that God answers prayer. He never will say, I'm too busy today. Every fear, every cure... He promised he would share. And although he's the Lord of all glory, yet he's only a prayer away. He's a prayer answering God in the big things. He's a prayer answering God in the big things. He answers prayers about health. He'll answer prayers about your family. He answers prayers about salvation. He's a prayer God answering. He answers prayer in the big things. And he answers prayer in the small things, in the wee things as well. Maybe I told you, I wonder did I ever tell you the story of the chicken pies. If I didn't, I'm going to for you, man. Maybe some of you have heard it before. But my daughter <clears throat> and my son-in-law, when they got married about five years ago now, they moved down to Cork, and they were working in a city of Cork Church down there, and they have a, they have a feed Cork program. And there's 250 people in those days. There was 250 homeless people, and, and they lie in the streets of Cork every night. And, and they go around and they visit them through the night and so on. It's an awful place sometimes. But anyway, they bring them in on a on a on a Wednesday and they feed them and they have this program and they feed them and so on. And then there's families come in and, and they're 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 not so well off and, and they're well vetted these particular families that come in on the Wednesday and they get a box with provision on it for a week. And uh, it's about 50 euro in this particular box. And uh, in those days there was 200, sorry, I'm wrong, 120 of these boxes at 50 euro each. So it's not hard to do the math. And God provided them all. And so Tuesday night's the big packing night and, and the boxes are set out and they're all all the stuff's put in, there's a box of cornflakes, and it's a thing of 
powdered milk and something else and something else, tissues and toilet roll, etc., etc. But this particular Tuesday night, there was just something missing. It's just they needed something else to fill the box. And the guys there that knew, they were taking a look and, and they said, well, what, what do we need? And they said, well, we're short, we need... And some of the boys says, well, I don't know, we need something. Look, I'll be chicken, like a chicken pie for the oven. And so they said, right, we need 120 chicken pies. We're going to get 120 chicken pies at 9 o'clock on a Tuesday night for dinner time on Wednesday. And so these guys, being who they are, and if you sort of knew them, they said, right, everything stops, we'll begin to pray for chicken pies. And so these guys all huddled together and they began to pray that God would send 120 chicken pies. Tuesday night at 9 o'clock. On Monday morning previous, there's a wee girl sitting in Marks and Spencer's in Cork and she's taping this order to Santa's stores in Dublin, the delivery. And uh, instead of hitting, instead of hitting 300, she hits 420. Uh, well, they said it was a mistake. Maybe God put the power in the wee fingers, the wee creeper. So anyway, the bottom line is this, that Marks and Spencers and Cork end up with a very short-dated, 120 chicken pies that are short-dated. And the night shift comes on, and these trolleys are sitting on Wednesday morning at 6 o'clock for the day shift coming in. And the manager says, what do we want to do? We want us to put these in the skip. And this guy says, well, there's a feed. You know, you know that feed cork program that we sponsor? Maybe they'd be glad of them. And so this guy lifts the phone. He phones my son-in-law in Cork. He lives in Cork and passes to us in Cork at half past six on a Wednesday morning. He says, Nathan, I know it's a bit of a sporadic request, but you'd hardly have anywhere for 120 chicken pies a day, would you? And so he's laying in bed. He can't get out. He's numb. <laughs> he says, yes, you not believe it. You not believe it. Yes, I can't. And he says, tell him, I'll come and lift them. The guy says, you'll do nothing with such thing. I'll put them in the barn. I'll get them delivered to you. So not only did God answer the prayer, but God delivered them to the church and court. So he's a God of the big things. And he's a God of the wee things. And so this, the psalmist, he waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined on to him the, um, the request, the result. I want you to think about the rescue, our time's flying. He brought me up also. You'll notice the word also. It doesn't say he brought me up out of a horrible pit. It says he brought me up also out of a horrible pit. Because we, we were all in a horrible pit. Because we're all sinners. Because the Bible says that each of us was born in sin. And we were shabled in iniquity. So we were all in a horrible pit, a pit of sin. And we would still be in the pit, only for God's grace and God's goodness to us. And this is a wonderful thing about salvation, because it doesn't matter how, how deep the pit, it doesn't matter how horrible the pit that you were in. God is able to bring you out of it. And so he was brought <coughs> up also, out of the horrible pit. Now, how did God bring him out of the horrible pit? Well, to bring him out of the horrible pit, remember Jeremiah was in the pit. Remember Joseph ended up in a pit. But he had to be brought out of the pit. And so God reached down and he put his hand out and he, he pulled him out of the pit, the horrible pit. And uh, as I thought about this last Sunday, and I was just thinking about Peter. Do you remember Peter? And uh, he got out of the boat that night. And for some reason, everybody puts the boat in Peter. But, I mean, there was a dozen men in the boat at least. And he was the only man had the guts to get out. And then we, come, and then we, we say, he was a bad person. But, you know, Peter got out of the boat and he began to walk. And then, do you remember that when he took his eyes off the Lord, it's something amazing in that. Again, it says that he began to sink. You don't begin to sink. You just sink. When you have the pool in your holidays and you step off the concrete and you, you try to get under the water, I mean, 
you just go down, you don't begin to sink. So God was in it all from the start. Peter began to sink. He didn't sink, he began to sink. And then, of course, he says, Lord, save me. And the Nazarene, the carpenter, put his hand into the fisherman's hand in Galilee and pulled him out. Lovely wee chorus, he came to me. He came to me when I couldn't come to where he was. He came to me. That's why he died on Calvary. When I couldn't come to where he was, he came to me. Another old hymn says, Preserve me, Jesus, when my feet made haste to hell. And there should I have gone, but God does all things well. His love was great and his mercy free, which from the pit delivered me. He brought me to the horrible pit. Out of the merry clay. Now all clay is sticky. Clay is a sticky substance. And there's times we end up and are walking in the middle of a field. Maybe stripping soil off a job or something. And it's a pleasure stripping soil off a job in the summertime. You pull the grass off and then you begin to pull the soil off it with the digger. And the dust is flying 20 foot in the air. It's class. Brilliant. But but at this time of the year, do you see? That's a, what's called a plugging match, a, a mucking match. Uh, and, and you have to have the welly boots on you, and as you're walking, they're just, you know, you're sort of squelching. That's the clay, but it's Mary clay. He, he, he brought me out of the Mary clay, and he set my feet upon a rock. With the rescue, I have the redemption. He set my feet upon a rock, Rock speaks of sureness. A rock speaks of stability. A rock speaks of soundness. The rock. I, I know very little about anything, but I know a wee bit about concrete, I know a wee bit about sand, I know a wee bit about rock for my sins. <clears throat> when you're testing rock, you take the piece of rock. And it goes into a lab. This, I know this will probably not interest you, but it interests me. It's for the point. And it goes into like a vase almost, this piece of rock. This piece of rock is picked out of a quarry face. And then there's a thing done on it called a PSV volume, which is polished stone volume, PSV. And there's like a pendulum almost, the same as you see on the clock. And it's set up and it comes down and it strikes the rock. And then the strike on the rock is measured digitally to a newton. It's measured in newtons. And then the stronger the newton, the better the rock. So good rock is somewhere between 60 and 70 PSV. I know it interests me, it doesn't interest you. I suppose the point I'm making is that he sets our feet upon a solid rock. The rock is solid. This rock is Jesus, he's the one. Be sure. Be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. He set my feet upon a rock and he established my goal. What does that mean? Well, you know what it means. He just, he changed us all around. He changed our life around. We were once in sin and now we're in salvation. We were once on the broad road and now we're on our road. We were once heading for a lost eternity, and now we're heading for heaven. What a hope for the believer to me. He put a, set our feet upon a rock, and he established our goings. That's our redemption. And then we rejoice in verse 3. He has put a new song in my mouth. A new song. Even praise unto our God. Many shall see it. And fear and shall trust in the Lord. My time's gone. He's put a new song in my mouth. That's the place of the song. Praise unto God. That's the praise of the song. And then the purpose of the song is this. Many shall see it, and shall fear, and shall trust in the Lord. You know, God's people have always been a people of song. You remember when Moses, you remember when the children of Israel come through the Red Sea, and they got the other side on dry land, what does the first thing they done? They sung a song. They sung a song. And that must have been some song. 
That'd be two million people standing on the side of the Red Sea and they begin to sing, God has triumphed gloriously. His, the horse and the rider has been washed into the sea. And did you ever think about this? Did you ever think about this? Water carries over music. I remember years ago, one Saturday night going out to lock up and I heard music. And I thought somebody had left a radio, a downtown radio that is, on in some of the lorries. And I walked around the lorries and there wasn't, and I thought it was doting, but I wasn't, I heard it. And anyway, I couldn't figure it out, but all the lorries were slacked and all the keys were out. So I knew it wasn't a radio when I went to bed. And then somebody told me the next morning that there'd been a massive rock concert in the Antrim Forum. And so it had carried across the water. I live right in the southern shore, Latin A. And so the, 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 the noise had carried over the water. Imagine two million people standing on the side of the Red Sea this morning and they begin to sing. Imagine that, that song heading away down into Egypt. Pharaoh and his men stand listening to that. Amazing, isn't it? They sung a, new, sung a song. And then do you remember the, the night that the Lord Jesus was betrayed? Do you remember in the upper room? Do you remember before they went out, they sang a song? Imagine them 12 men singing a hymn that night. Maybe they were all tanners or all the different types of places. But imagine sitting beside the Lord. Imagine sitting beside the Lord and him singing. There wouldn't have been too many dud notes early. Amazing, wouldn't it have been? Listening to that. And of course the great song of heaven, when the redeemed get to heaven, they'll sing the song of the redeemed. Unto him who hath loved us and washed us from our sin in his precious blood and made us kings and priests unto our God. And forever and ever we'll sing. Imagine the song of heaven. What a day, what a day that's going to be. Ari Andrew spoke on this one time in Ardmore many years ago. And I wrote it down. And his points were out of the pit and out of the mire, under the rock and into the choir. Someone said we were brought up, we were set up, we were tuned up. Anyway, it's amazing, isn't it? He's put a new song in our mouth. Even praise unto our God. It's the song of the soul set free. I wonder... We are singing day by day. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us. Thank you for saving our soul, for making us whole, and for giving to me thy great salvation, so rich, so full, and so free. May God bless his word to our hearts tonight. Lord, we thank you tonight for these lovely verses that we've just considered. And even though our, our remarks tonight, Lord, were scattered, and we just prayed you'd bless them, Lord, and must and of thee. We'll tell you that you'll use it and we'll spin of self for bread you'll take it away tonight. Pray that your name will be honoured and glorified. Thank you for these lovely psalms in our Bible, Lord. And we just pray that you bless our meditation to us tonight. Thank you, Lord. We pray that we would be a thankful people. I thank you that we've been brought out of the horrible pit. Thank you that you've set our feet upon a rock. Thank you that you've established our going. And pray that we, day by day, would sing the new song the song of the soul set free. Lord bless the assembly here. Thank you for it. Thank you for all the friends tonight. I just pray to bless them all as they leave and go home, Lord, to each of our different places, home tonight, Lord. Pray for every family represented, every home represented, Lord. We pray for our children. We pray for our grandchildren tonight. We pray for those that still don't know thee. We pray in these the closing days of time that would come to know the Lord Jesus as their saviour. So, Lord, bless us now, part us with your fear, and with your favor, keep your hand upon us, take us home in safety, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah.